Thank you very much, everybody, for joining today's session. As you can see, I've got Mark Pert, the uh, founder of DIT AgTech with us. And today's session is all about understanding DIT AgTech, where it's been, where it's going, and why it's raising funds on Virtual Today. My name is Robin Holt, and I'm the uh, host from virtual here today um, and really my objective is going to be taking you through DIT AgTech its business and answering any of your questions um, that I can on the virtual side but also making sure um, that we get as much information out of DIT AgTech up uh, and well in, in line with its opening investment offer next week. So Mark I thought I'd throw to you really quickly just to introduce yourself and uh, yeah really just say hi to everyone quickly. Thanks, Robin, and uh, hello to all the listeners out there. So, Mark Pierce, my name. I'm the CEO and founder of the business, and just a small part of the business. A lot of great people who are not here today who are actually doing the grind every day and out working. So, I'm privileged to be able to speak to you and present to you. So, thanks for the opportunity, Robin. No, fantastic, fantastic. And so, today, as I promised, I, I would outline the format for today. We've got a number of questions which have come through from investors throughout the process. And Mark has been down this route. This is your third equity crowdfunding campaign, which is awesome. And really for the for the fact that we're kind of going through a lot of these questions, we do hope a lot of these questions will provide you with some insight. But what I'd really love to encourage everybody to do is actually use the Q&A feature um, that uh, Taryn here has already used, which is great to see. Uh, what we'll be doing is we'll be answering a lot of these questions which have come through from investors, but they're also very insightful around the business. And then we'll also be applying some of your questions that are coming through um, in between those as well. So at any point in time, please feel free to pop in a question to the Q&A, especially when it's hot um, on your mind and you really want to have that question answered. So where better to kick off than uh, hear all about DIT AgTech and how it started, how it's got here, and really, um, yeah, your journey to date, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Robin. So, um, you know, DIT AgTech has probably been accumulation of 35 years of experience in the extensive agriculture. And, you know, I'm 54 years old, so this is not my first radio in life, guys, and having businesses, but I probably realize that you know this is what my life's mission is um, with all the learnings I've got. DIT started a bit over four years ago. The the vision for, for the business from day one was to help farmers better feed the world. I'm personally concerned about food security in the next 30 years. I'm concerned about the environment. And the way we help these farmers better feed the world is with tech that enables them to produce more with less better. And our offering is we develop hardware and software that injects additives into the water so animals can consume these additives to increase their welfare, increase their production, and in time, reduce their uh, methane emissions. And our business is very much like a SaaS business. Um, we call it a supplements as a service. We install the tech or we rent the tech to our farmers. So there's very little barriers to entry for them to adopt our proposition. And then they pay us every time an animal drinks, we create revenue from the drinking patterns of the animals. And as all of the listeners here know, animals need to drink every day. And ruminant animals being livestock, sheep, uh, cattle, goats, buffaloes, camels, they all drink proportional to their body weight. So our tech um, can work out how heavy they are and we can, we can inject into their drinking water additives to enhance production, welfare, and as I said, in time, reduce methane emissions. Yeah, absolutely. That's a lot of water, I can imagine, that you go through when you look at the data, especially on those massive farms. Um, look, I mean, when it comes to the business, I think uh, I have the, the benefit of knowing your business for a long time now. And I can see and have heard a lot about what your customers have said about what the business is, has meant. So implementing DIT's tech, uh, DIT AgTech's tech rather, um, into these farms and really what those farmers have been able to say about the businesses themselves, but I think from their perspective, you must have heard some incredible stories. Oh, we have, Robin, look, and, and, and we've got so much data now. And the thing I think we did really good in DIT early up is we knew that to really move the needle in extensive agriculture, we needed to partner with the leading farmers. So mm. our, you know, our top 10 customers, um, who are probably 70% of our revenue, are the largest corporate 
farming enterprises in Australia. Macquarie Bank is our biggest customer with their Paraguay Pastoral Company. They've been a customer now for coming up three years um, and are all the other leading agricultural companies. Why are we scaling up? Because we're helping these, these farmers produce more with less better. What does that mean? Mm. It means more calves on the ground. We have customers that run 20,000 breeding cows. Yeah. And they're, they're seeing an increase of 10 to 15% more calves on the ground. What this mm. means is more kilos of meat out the farm gate to feed the rising population, but less animals on the livestock. So we're doing what our core is, produce more with less. So we're seeing increased production. And, and you know, a calf is worth $1,000 when it hits the ground, Robin. These businesses are, are seeing sort of $2 million of extra revenue um, because of our products. But we're decreasing the cost of their supplementation programs. We're taking all the labour out of their business so they can focus on the welfare of their animals and looking after the landscape. That's what. Mm. That's the sort of um, information that comes back to us. And that's why we're scaling up now because farmers buy people, um, just like, you know, people buy people, but farmers want uh, suppliers like DIT Ag Tech to be strategically aligned in their outcomes. We have sure. a boots on the ground philosophy and farmers talk over the fence. So, you know, when you're doing a great job for one farmer and you're helping them to produce more food, they talk to their mates next door. So that's, awesome. that's our pipeline. That's the feedback today. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, when you're building a business in, in a close knit community, you can't, you, you, I mean, of course it goes without saying you have to serve the needs of that customer the best as you possibly can. But also when you're growing and getting glowing testimonials, it, it's just a fantastic response that even your customers themselves are the ones that are actually helping the business to grow. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think it's actually a really interesting segue into um, Taryn's question here, which has asked around if DIT has looked into the area of carbon credits and carbon um, sequestra sequestration, um, which essentially, I know we had a conversation even around methane the other day, um, and you were giving some really in valuable insights on this. So over to you, Mark. Yeah, so, so it's a great question, Taryn, and there'll be a lot in the offer document when we release, when we launch the round next week. Now, just quickly, we are raising money to actually expand that opportunity. However, we're also very committed to executing to deliver our, our tech and to build this livestock uh, technology platform. But there are a lot of additives um, out in the market now that do reduce methane, being scientifically tested. One of the challenges is how do you deliver these products to extensive agriculture. Now, extensive agriculture are the biggest emitters of methane, not the feedlots, not the dairies. That's not correct. The biggest emitters are extensive agriculture. But how do we do this over millions and hundreds of millions of acres across the planet? Well, at DIT, we believe we do it through the water. And the basis of this livestock technology platform we are building has the opportunity to do that. So, Taryn, very conceptually what we're, what we're working on now and, and to where we have been talking to the clean energy regulator. We are scoping up to start trials with CQ Uni with a mandate we have signed to develop methodologies. It will be to inject into the water these specific additives. And because our, our software is so advanced now that we can then interpret these additives that go in the water from our current products, we can actually build feed analysis dashboards, which we do. Our farmers can see in real time how much crude protein the animals are getting a day, how much phosphorus, trace elements, these things. In reduced to methane reduction, we inject these additives and we just back solve that with our software to create a methodology to say those thousand cows have consumed this much of the product. The science says that they reduce methane by this much. We can create a digital platform to lodge with the clean energy regulator and claim carbon credits. Now, no one else is doing that in the world. We've already put some patents on putting these products through the water. We think that it's a tremendous opportunity to our business and it is the future, but um, we are working on it, but we're working probably harder on just getting our tech out in the field, Robin, and building out our technology platform, just grinding away, doing what we do best. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. And I think um, one of the pieces as well, which I found really interesting about your business is when it got to, I mean, when the pandemic hit, a lot of businesses really were considering what they could do to 
well, secure the future of their business, what revenue streams they could add to their business. And in, in a lot of cases, that did mean pivoting. But for you, I mean, while you did pivot some of the revenue streams slightly, um, I know that that really helped secure your business, but also help the farmers as well. I mean, why don't you talk a bit more about that pivot and the, the revenue streams that you added? Thanks, thanks, Robin. And look, probably I'm really proud of the way we did navigate COVID. And I can touch on it now that when people see the offer document, they're going to see our revenue has gone down since FY29. But there's reasons for that. COVID was the biggest one. We had a big presence in, in the southern states. Mm. Um, well, for the last 12 months, we have not been able to service any of those customers. We have one, one employee down there. So when COVID came along, as a team, we thought to ourselves, like, what can we do? And probably at the core of DIT is, what are the problems that farmers have? You know, how can we solve real problems? And one of the biggest problems with supplementing, Robin, is that it's very, very labour intensive. You can imagine taking a 100 kilo lick block and putting it across a million acres uh, day in, day out to deliver to 50. How do you record it, though? How do you even track that? Well, well, you can't track it. You know, they, yeah. you can't. And, you know, that goes on to the opportunities of, of being able to capture carbon credits because our platform sure. does it. So it's a big labour challenge. So we decided that, why don't we go to our customers and say we can solve that problem? So we move to a full service model. And in our full service model, we install all the tech on farm. We manage the, the nutritional, the supplementing programs in conjunction with the customer. The customer only pays on what the animals use. Now, I can say that off the back of that, every one of our large corporates are adopting that because the yeah. biggest saving for them is less labour. That means they've got more time to look after the welfare of the animals. That's less driving, less emissions, less impact. And what we do now is we, we run our logistics with the use of our platform and the software so that we can be as efficient as we can. And we've worked out with software. We know exactly on the consumption of animals when our supplement tanks uh, will be needing to be topped up. We're putting bigger supplement tanks in so we don't need to go there for six months. And because of the telemetry opportunities, we can manage all this remotely. So it's it's been a big pivot for the business, but it's really meant that we've found our way to the thing. And again, we've solved another real problem for farmers. No, absolutely. Super, really interesting always to uh, hear really about the strategy and what's what's kind of helped a lot of those farmers across the across the country, really, because you uh, you are a business that has to go out to particularly remote areas to serve some of these farmers. Um, we've got a couple of questions from Shane Lee, and thanks very much for raising your hand just on these questions. I think, um, well, yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll throw over to Mark for a couple of these, but um, Shane has asked, what are the, what are you doing in Lockyer Valley and elsewhere with fertigation? Yeah, yeah, so, so we were sort of quite advanced on that before COVID came. Um, it's, still on the, it's still on the agenda. To be honest, we're, we're taking a bit of a subtle approach there. We're focusing on where the revenue is now. Mm. Um, again, it's all got to do with capital and where we deploy that capital and, and where we get the most growth for our shareholders. Sure. Right now, the focus is on growing the revenue. But again, great opportunity still down there. You know, we're, we're, we're very eager to revisit the learnings we have already in horticulture. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah, the, I mean, the second question is, will you be pursuing horticulture further? So, yeah. I yeah mean, right, look, it's, a, it's, a, it's already, another opportunity. And, yeah. and Robin, I, I, think, I think this is, is something probably goes to the, to the soul of a lot of startups. You know, you've got to be careful when you're a sort of scale-up startup because there's so many opportunities. Absolutely. And I suppose my yeah. experience to date has, has, has taught me it's so important about execution where we are now and execution around growing our revenues getting profitable because yep. when we're profitable we have the ability to really make an impact in other sectors of the market like horticulture so the board the board and myself as in the senior management team um we haven't taken our eyes off horticulture definitely not but the but the prize right now is to grow the revenues in northern australia and capture that first mover advantage and build our platform and do a real land grab in Northern Australia to build our brand and, and to be the leading ag tech business in this country in extensive agriculture and soon, one day, around the globe. 
Yeah, such a really interesting point um, when it comes to it. I mean, yeah, the number of opportunities that are in front of you and which option you choose is it can really define the business moving forward. So really interesting. Michael, thank you very much for raising your hand. We're using the Q&A feature exclusively for just going through all of these questions. So please do populate your question in the Q&A box and we'll absolutely attend to it as soon as possible. I can see some other questions coming through, but I'm also really keen to um, get on to some of one of the next questions which I've got um, here, which has come through a couple of times. And that's really what else is in the pipeline. You've already touched on this, but I think this is a perfect segue. So what else is in the pipeline for DIT Ag Tech and what strategy or new tech are you working on that maybe we haven't focused on quite as much just yet? Yeah, 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 no, good question. Um, there's a lot going on. You know, one of the things that we've used the funds from the last crowd fund is really to build our tech team. You know, at the at the at the end of the day, we're a tech business. So we've got to have the best people doing that. I've mm. uh, got some great, I just want to put it out there. We've got some really great tech guys, engineers and software developers. And mm. you know, it's a really diverse multicultural team there in Townsville, and they're doing great work. What is the work? Well, we're trying to make our doses as reliable as possible. You know, so there is, we're doing a lot of work on that. We've started work on reinventing our whole water monitoring uh, devices. They're, they're very clunky and all the devices that are in the, in the marketplace now are very clunky, they're expensive. So um, we've got a beta version now, which, which will be in the offer document, I can talk about it now. We've been able to, to decrease the cost of our manufacturing of our water monitoring devices um, to about a third of what they were. We're, we're partnering with an, an Aussie company, um, Mary Altor, which have low orbit satellites. So we've done to get the price of that data that's being transmitted right down. We have been using Inmarsat, which, which is a lot more expensive. So these little devices, and we haven't brought up a name yet, but they're a little bot device that will be a plug and play. So it'll be able to put on a water tank and it'll have a probe. We can measure how much water. You'll be able to put it on a trough with an ultrasonic sensor and you'll know how much water is in the trough. You'll be able to connect it to a water meter and know how much water the animals are drinking if you want to have it separate to the doser. Um, the bots will also be able to, in time, we will replace the IDPs. We buy the IDPs that go on our, on our doses now. We will be manufacturing those IDPs. So they're the, that's like the terminal that communicates the satellites. Um, they're going to be really great. And I'll tell you conceptually how they're going to work. We will be able to build them for sub $300 and we will actually offer these to our customers. So if someone's on our full service model, they've got 50,000 head of cattle, they've got 15 of our doses and they're paying $2 a litre for the supplement, we will actually be able to say to those customers, hey, we can put 50 of our devices across all your water monitors. We'll build your dashboard so you'll have more visibility um, and our cost will only be $15,000 to do that. So I think you can see, Robin, how we're building a technology platform by integrating IoT devices, and all this information will be on our customers' dashboard. So in real time, or plus I didn't say that the, the bots will also be little rain gauges, which we've mm. been doing, but we've got the, so much accurate. So if you can imagine across the landscape, the farmer logs in, he can see all the rainfall on different areas, where his water is, how much these animals are being dosed with supplements, how much crude protein they're getting, all those things. And we're also doing a lot of testing of pasture and soils. And then we, we upload that data on what's happening in real time so that we can make predictive um, decisions or algorithms for the farmer to say, hey, the crude yeah. protein is going down in the grass. We think you now need to increase the dose rate of the crude protein. That's where we're heading. That's very exciting. And again, off the back of all these learnings, off the back of these platforms in time we'll put these additives into the water and you'll actually on your dashboards be able to see in real time how much of your methane emissions you've reduced on a day by day basis but this is this is leading edge stuff when we get to that stage yeah and it, it goes to yeah. the core of our purpose of you know producing more with less better and i'm, I'm really passionate as you can see about solving no, that definitely solving those those issues <laughs> yeah. for, of course, of course. And um, no, I mean, the the possibility, really, when you really look at it for farmers out there with what you're doing, it makes their job so much easier. 
uh, than before. And it's, it's just fantastic to kind of hear where your tech is going. I think there's a couple of questions here above from Rick and Chris, and we're going to get to that um, in a second. But I just think the perfect question to ask here is from Siobhan, um, who is asking, do you have worldwide patents on your technology? Because there's no doubt that you, you're looking, you've expanded to us in, you've expanded across Australia, but there's got to be a lot of opportunities overseas that you can see here. Yeah, that's um, it's, it's a good question, Siobhan, and, and you're correct. We used some of our crowdfunding money last time, as we said, to enhance our patent protection. So we have now lodged um, our patents in Brazil, the US, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and we've actually also put innovation patents um, on taking these current additives that are in the marketplace to reduce methane and putting them through an electronic doser into the drinking water to reduce methane in ruminant animals. So we're well advanced on that uh, bib that runs all of our commercial ops and R&D. She spends a lot of time, well, she has spent a lot of time in getting to that stage. Awesome. Is there, um, is there any way you reckon you could talk about maybe one of your immediate, opportunity, immediate opportunities that you see in the market um, internationally and, and perhaps one of those countries that you would say probably our most achievable mm. strategy that we could focus on in the near future with where we might be able to go? Yeah, yeah, Robin, I'm, I'm always mindful of talking about too much blue sky. So, of course, you know, our, our, of course. our focus is on execution now. However... The biggest opportunity for us is Brazil, guys. You know, like Brazil yeah. is a big competitor of Australia. You know, mm -hmm. We have 25 million head of cattle in Australia. They have 210 million head. Mm -hmm. Something interesting about Brazil, bud, is they, they have a wet and dry like we do. So they have a, a real problem with crude protein in their mm -hmm. grasses for, for their livestock. Um, but their government is, is so much more um, advanced and proactive in getting farmers to reduce methane. You've only got to go online. You know, the, the Brazilian government is really pushing their farmers to reduce their methane emission. And something else that's interesting about Brazil is it's, it's about the only country that I've researched where they're legislating their farmers to protect their waterways and protect open water sources and not let livestock go into those ecosystems because they want to protect them. Um, so that means a lot of Brazil Brazilian livestock producers are moving to pipe network. So they're having to pipe their, their water through pipes. And again, as any shareholder in DIT or people that have read some of or seen some of our um, information, that's perfect for DIT. So yes, big opportunity over there, yeah. um, Robin. But as a mate of mine says, you need to nail it before you scale it. And we intend to nail it totally. in Australia before we scale it globally. Yeah, totally. And I, I really think your strategy for for going across Australia and making this a, a very well-known brand within um, the ag tech industry itself, which, uh, I mean, we can look at even on a statistical basis and say that it's really, it, it, it's, it's got to be able to support high growth because of the demands um, worldwide that we do see. But really interesting data on Brazil. I think that's super insightful. I think um, we'll jump to Rick's question now, which is really just asked, given you already have some of the top 10 corporate farms across Australia. How much upside is there for DIT at the moment? I'm, I'm sure you probably already had that question uh, asked, asked of you already. So over to you, Mark. Yeah, so um, good question, Rick. Again, a lot of this information will be in the offer document because we're, you know, we're a scale-up business. There'll be a lot more data there so you mm -hmm. can see these, you know, what is our addressable market? What's our pipeline? What's our traction? but very high level to meet our FY22 projections, which we are on track at the moment. Um, we, we need the capture of our target market in Northern Australia. This is our current pipeline of customers. So the current customers that we're focusing on, what we're really doing is scaling those customers. So we might only be doing 5,000 they heard it now and they've got 100,000. We want to move to 20,000 and 30,000. Um, to meet our FY22 figures, we only need to capture 1.3% of that market. Um, and that's only 3 million head of cattle to meet mm. FY22. To meet our FY23 numbers of where we want to go, uh, which is you know, quite, a, quite a bit of solid growth, but again, it's only scaling the current customers. We still only will have about 9% of our current customers' capacity. Now, the addressable market in northern Australia alone is 11 million head of cattle. There's 15 million head across northern Australia that are fed between 20 and $100 per head. We've, we've defined that down further to say there's a broader market of 11 million. 
look, that's not including Southern Australia. That's not including sheep. Robin, we, we haven't put that in projections. Or I think that the market in Southern Australia is bigger than mm. Northern Australia, but it's a different market. We've got, yeah. you know, tens of thousands of farmers down there. We need to nail what we're doing now, and then our go-to-market will be different down south. Mm. Most definitely. Most definitely. You have to apply a different approach for different parts of the country. Um, that's super interesting to know. And Chris here has asked where you're up to with remote monitoring. I know that you've, um, yeah, actually, I don't want to answer for you. <laughs> I'll hand this over to you because I can probably half answer it, but I probably won't cover it all. Hey, um, Chris, our, our core of our business is remote monitoring. You know, we we, we, we own all that infrastructure that, that drives our IoT devices, those devices that communicate with satellites or the next G network. Um, it's core to what we do. It's it's complex that back-end architecture, the ability to, to communicate with a satellite, download that data into our workers, our databases, put it into our servers, and then interpret that data into dashboards. Mm. And we, we have four software developers who work on that every single day. So, yes, that's all our remote monitoring. We can control all our doses remotely now, we do. And we are, we are looking at other IoT devices, like I said earlier about this little bot. I've just um, seen a, a comment as well from Chris in the same sense. And I he think he's, he's mentioned I'm referring to cameras. So with regards to that, because I know oh, yeah. that you've got the platform um, itself, which you can see the data with. But yeah, I mean, even on the camera side itself. Yes. And, and sorry, Chris, I probably should have said that when I was talking about the bot. We have got beta versions of these cameras now that are working. So the ability of, of these little bots to hook a camera on, they can take photos. They're, they're only next to you now, not satellite because we're waiting for uh, the price of some of these low orbit satellites to come down. So, yeah, they're already they're already in a beta phase with the little tank monitors. And, again, sorry about that, but this is where we build this platform. So farmers can log into their cameras, see their livestock, they can see their water, they can see their doses, they can see their rainfall all put onto one dashboard, and then they can interpret it at length as they go through. Fantastic. Fantastic. No, thanks for the questions. And everybody who's been asking questions, really, really appreciate it. There's great questions in here. Um, I guess we'll move on down through some of the other ones because, uh, yeah, I, I mean, this is exactly what this session is for. So Anton here has asked a question. Have you looked at a non-satellite option for customers who are farming in areas with uh, GSM coverage? Um, yeah, we have. We have. And at, at this stage, it's challenging to put all that infrastructure in um, in some of these areas, like mm. especially around, probably looked around a lot of Loran and those sort of things. We've got a little way to go. And I think the other thing we've got to think about with that is like, what's the revenue model for it as well? Exactly. So as much as we could do it, you know, what's the cost benefit to our farmers? Like a farmer's not going to pay more money uh, just for something funky, but, but we are researching all these things. And look, it's exponentially advancing. That there's a lot of providers out there that, that ex exponentially advance. Exactly, exactly. And when we were talking about the fully integrated platform, I saw a comment from Paul relating to the DIT bot. So thanks very much for the enthusiasm, Paul. It's awesome to see. Really appreciate the comment. David here has asked a question. What are the key barriers to uptake of this um, tech in the in Northern Oz, so essentially in Northern Territory? Um, E.g., do you find there are difficulties in implementing this tech in tropical environments where there's surface water throughout the wet season when cattle won't necessarily drink um, uh, from trolls, uh, trouts? Sorry. Trolls, yeah. Trolls. Um, another good question, and, and I can answer that. So firstly, in regards to the uptake, People talk about in, in tech businesses churn, mm. you know, lots of VCs, oh, what's your churn? Um, we're very different to all those. Like our churn is we don't we haven't to date had a farmer that hasn't adopted, you know, when we've gone to them, um, but again, we've picked our customers as well. In fact, it's the opposite. The, the the biggest barrier for us is having enough capital to build these doses and install. So we we're on this trajectory where we have to be very careful of who we engage with as a customer, you know, what's the best bang for our basket and can we deliver? One thing we, we're trying hard to not do is to promise farmers that we're going to do something because mm. you just can't break that trust with a farmer, you know. So we don't want to um, over-promise and under-deliver. We really try to over-deliver and under-promise. The other questions about troughs, it's a great question. It gets asked me all the time and, look, we have a lot of data on that. There is this conception that during the wet season in northern Australia, the animals don't come back to the trough. So I'll put it to you like this. Would you rather drink water 
out of a dirty creek or a dirty muddy hole that's got rain in it or would you rather walk back to the trough where there's clean fresh water i can tell you now that 70 percent of livestock always goes back to the trough because we've got the data because we know how many cattle are there we know what they're drinking that's the data that we know um so you are correct in a wet season that animals will go and drink other places, but you'll find that our customers are leaving the doses on all through the wet season. Um, and they're also using traditional lick because of course there will be livestock who will walk out and be drinking this dirty water out of a water hole. Um, so they do put a, a little bit of traditional supplement out there, but 70% of them come back to the troughs. What's interesting is we also have customers who, who want the animals to go and eat the grass further out instead of coming to the trough, because a lot of animals are coming back to the trough because of the taste of it with the salts from our supplements, they sort of, they come back to the, the, the trough to, to drink, the, drink the water with the supplements. Awesome, super insightful, really, really interesting. Um, Warwick here has asked a question around government grants. I'm sure you've got a lot to cover in this area. All over it, Warwick, all over it. Um, one thing DIT has been good at is bootstrapping the business to date. Uh, we have we have got quite a few applications in right now. There's a big government grant process called the Mineral Application. It's all around developing techniques for methane reduction in extensive agriculture. We've applied for a million dollar grant right now. It was supposed to be released last month, but with the change in the minister from um, Porter to Taylor, there's been delays in there. We've also got applications in with quite a few other uh, government bodies around work we want to do in production feeding of putting urea and fossils in the water to go from maintenance feeding of animals to actually production feeding. Uh, that's another one. We've got grants um, we've applied to and we're discussing with MLA around getting third-party research on drinking behaviours, exactly yeah. showing how many cattle come back to the trough and, you know, do more cattle drink out of the trough with our supplements in it or do they drink more and how much do they drink? A lot of farmers in Northern Australia think their cattle drink 40, 50 litres. That's not the data we have um, mm. on an adult equivalent of between 27 and 30 litres a day, which oh. no one's ever done any of that research before at scale. And we're doing it at scale every day because we've got this technology platform that gives us this data in real time. So, yeah, no, there's lots of Viv and her team work tirelessly on that. It's, it's very important to validate everything we're doing in DIT with science and data and third parties. Um, it's a big part of the business, Robin. Definitely. Very interesting as well. Uh, thanks very much for the question, Borak. And, and thanks everybody else for the other questions. I think it's really insightful and I'm really pleased that they just keep on coming in. So we've got a question here from Paul. Um, how, Mark, uh, are you protecting your business from potential competitors in Australia and potentially overseas? Yeah, great question, Paul. Um, I think about it a lot. You know, there's things that I lie in bed awake at. And one thing is, how could we be disrupted? You know, we mm. know we're disrupting a lot of people. You've always got to be thinking that. Uh, right now, probably the ones that worry me the most, you know, are those smart, young, innovative zero starters that come out of nowhere. If you talk about the incumbents, the, the big supplementing companies, how have we protected ourselves? Well, the number one thing is, is our patterns, first of all. And as we have spoken about, Robin, to be able to supplement livestock crude protein at scale in the drinking water mm. there's a lot of chemistry innovation and the use of urea phosphate and i think that's probably the biggest thing in our business is the chemistry innovation so that's what we've protected so they would need to use urea phosphate to be able to get the crude protein in the water without it settling out and control it and, and the way it catalyzes in the water uh, that would be an infringement the second thing is they would have to develop technology devices like ours and again a big business that not a tech business it's difficult to build all that tech. It's difficult to build the teams. They need to be a tech um, telemetry business too. They have to have all that back-end infrastructure communicating with satellites and programmers. So they need to be able to also pivot and bring that onto their business. But the biggest barrier they're going to have, Robin, is just our boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. It's so oh, important to, to be with our people, you know, and our revenue models. Yep. So for them to compete with us, they will need to put the tech in. You know, they will need to do the work. And I go back to where we started, Robin. The biggest problem we're solving for a farmer that they think mm. is just the labour to put out supplements. So we solve that for them and they're happy to pay for our services. So other people will yeah. have to do that. Um, not impossible. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not naive to think that we couldn't be disruptive. But that's, 
that's how we're protecting ourselves. And we really want to build our brand. Paul, you know, we want to we want to be seen as the ag tech provider to farmers, the trusted ag tech provider. And I think if you see any of our stuff online, one of the best comments we get from our customers is our boots on the ground. We, we understand livestock production. You know, we understand the bush. We've all grown up yeah. there and we're passionate about it. And, and farmers see that. Farmers see that. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, and Brett here has got a, a really interesting question um, asking, are you looking at marketing the water monitoring service independent of the supplement service with the value proposition being directly against ball runners, et cetera, and a foothold for later supplement, supplementation opportunities? Yeah, yeah, look, um, we speak a lot with our clients about, you know, the water monitoring mm. um, and taking away a ball, a ball mechanic. And I think this is one of the things we've got to think about with tech in extensive agriculture. We're never going to be able to not take our hands off off getting out in the landscape, like checking our grasses and looking at our soils and actually more important, yep. actually looking at our animals. But look, already water monitoring is up. It, it like is assisting boar mechanics or boar runners because they can say, hey, where are the problem boars? You know, where do we need to go? Mm -hmm. But there's probably a bigger, there's probably a bigger um, challenge there is just getting the bandwidth to be able to take that data because you might go to a tank and you know it's 90%. But is the trough, is the trough dripping? You know, is the float valve stuck? Is there an animal? that might have, or, you know, an animal or wildlife might have accidentally got, fell in the trough and you've got to take it out. So until we can get multiple cameras and drones and all those things, it's a little way yeah. off. It's, it's a good question, but, um, but yeah, we've still got to, you know, we've still got to get out there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's really interesting. And um, Daniel here has asked a question around capital raising itself. So you've mentioned there have been two previous capital raises. There's been two previous equity crowdfunding raises. Um, one, is there likely to be a significant dilution to previous investors? And two, what are the plans for DIT AgTech to raise sufficient capital not to require another round in the future? I'll, I'll hand this over to you, Mark, to really run through the, the whole um, pipeline. Yeah, look, Daniel, we've we've had a we've had a convertible note in the marketplace uh, to raise up to eight million dollars. We've, we've raised two point six of that now. We've got a commitment for another million, and I'm still talking with people every day. Mm. Uh, a lot of people have asked the question, "Why are you going back to the crowd?" Well, well, I'll tell you why we're going back to the crowd. Because we are getting phone calls all the time from people to saying we want to be a part of this. You know, we want to actually invest in a business that's actually shoring up food security, and. Mm. I'm also personally a big believer in crowdfunding. You know, I, I love the idea of everyday Australians being part of the growth of a business like DIT and all the wonderful businesses that, that Virtual have um, on their platform. And, and from being one of the first companies to ever crowdfund sort of nearly three years ago, I've got yeah. a first-hand experience to see how it really is changing the capital markets. You're even starting to see VCs investing in some of these offers just like virtual had success the other day Definitely. so we're starting to get noticed um or crowdfunding is getting noticed but i think what's important to remember is you need to be agile you know you, you need to look at all the opportunities if something's not working as quick as you thought you need to go the other direction and that's one thing we've been good at at dit is we've been raising in a convertible note at more the wholesale level it wasn't accelerating as much as we liked. The take-up wasn't as much as I liked or the board liked. So we said, let's do a crowdfund. Um, that's why we're doing a crowdfund. Will we need more capital? You know, the magic number for us is, is $8 million to execute on our five-year business plan. If we want to go overseas, yes, we potentially will. Will shareholders get diluted here? Whenever you raise capital, yes, shareholders do get diluted. But what's important for the shareholder is, what is the value of my shares? Have they gone up? Exactly. Um, the Bill Gates, the, the Mark Zuckerbergs, they got diluted. Everyone gets diluted. But what's most important is, are we increasing our revenues? Are we increasing our customers? You know, are we increasing our shareholder value? That's what I'm focused at and what the board is focused at all the time. Mm. And just oh, remember, Rob, man. just remember, Robin, I, I get diluted too, you know, just course, like everyone else. Yeah. yeah, I think for me, I mean, even... Um, running well I, I was uh working with you in the first um the campaign last time and uh working with you on this capital raise as well through virtual again i think a lot of the questions which i see come through uh what i've particularly found enjoyable to see is that 
you're agile like a startup, but you're not really a startup in the sense of just all the operations that you've, well, you, you're mature in a sense of the business because of the fact that you've got all these patents and you've got so much IP and you're building all this tech and you've really grown to become well-known in your industry um, itself. And so people, when they look at the business, they just think that's got so many potential opportunities. And you talk about these opportunities and which direction you want to go in. Um, and when it comes to raising capital, it's very hard to determine exactly if one capital raise is the last capital raise that you're going to do. Because if you see another opportunity in the future, well, you have to be able to say, okay, we need to make a decision on whether or not we double down on this and really grow so then we can see the business triple its valuation in five, in you know, a few years' time, et cetera. So it's it's obviously a really hard um, piece to determine. And I think just in line with that line with that question, Patrick here has asked a question about if an IPO is an option to raise capital. And I'm sure you've been asked this in the past. So I think I'll just um, yeah move on to that question. But Daniel, thank you very much for your question on raising capital. Up there. Um, yeah, Patrick. Uh, yes, you know, an IPO is definitely, you know, an exit strategy. Now, we have we have 500 shareholders and with the expressions of interest, it looks like we might be inviting another 500 shareholders, which is great. Mm. The people that have backed myself personally from day one and also the business as we've gone forward, you know, everyone needs, needs a liquidity event. And I think our board and myself as a founder is very motivated to find that liquidity event. And just on a side note, Robin, you know, I, I hope one day that some of those people that invested Five thousand dollars in our first crowdfund, we can create that liquidity event, and they've created fifty thousand because it makes yeah. a big difference to their lives. But just on a just you know that was a bit off off point there. But yeah, we are. Um, we're looking at a, at a at a at an IPO before June twenty four. We had a look at it next year. Um, the board had, and you know since John Didams has come on the board, he, he sits on. Uh, two listed biotech companies taking 20 companies public. We felt that we're leaving a little bit too much on the table because of, to get this monthly recurring revenue up, I think that you would the earliest you would see a listing on the AXX for DIT would mm -hmm. probably be in early of um, January, or late, late of January, uh, sorry, of 22, or as early as, or as late as probably the middle of FY23. Mm. Fantastic. Fantastic. And um, I will say we've just got a few minutes left and we've got a few questions still to go, but I'm really keen to make sure that we answer all of these. Um, so we'll definitely be getting through them. I'll shorten Jane. the answer too. I'll shorten the answer. <laughs> all, all good. All good. And um, Chang Lee has asked a question, but not before making a comment that Elon Musk Starlink is, is now here, <laughs> which is great to see. Uh, Jane, thanks very much for the question on also, if they are your biggest customer, why don't Macquarie Bank fund you? Uh, good question. I've already spoken to them because they don't have um, a mandate within their organisation to fund into a business at our scale now. If we were bigger, yes, yeah. we would. But right at this point in time, it doesn't suit their mandate. Yeah. Hence, equity crowdfunding itself. It's a yes. very... Useful and I've gone, and I've gone down that rabbit hole too, mate. I've, um, I've spoken to people. So yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And Brett here has asked, what competitors do you have and what barriers to a competitor imitating your service? I know you touched on this before, um, but if there was anything else that you had to add. Um, there's FarmBot. FarmBot do, do, do water monitoring equipment. They don't do doses. Yeah. Uh, they're a competitor, but they don't do a doser. There are some mechanical doses in the marketplace, but they don't have all the safety functions to feed urea. Again, that's a really important one. Mm. Um, the other competitors are the traditional lick businesses like the stock licks and the Ridleys. Again, they're commodity businesses. They just sell it in bulk. They make small margins. They don't have the same value proposition as us. But like I said earlier, you know, it's not to say that someone couldn't come out there, but there's a lot of barriers of entry for them to come and chase us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Tony here has asked a really interesting question. If you can share any early results of um, the AB testing of supplements versus no supplements for farmers um well supplements in the i'll tell you now between supplements and no supplements is the difference and we've known this for 50 years in our country the difference between production or zero production so putting dry lick and lick blocks yeah. we do it because we need to maintain their health and well-being mm. water supplementing we've decreased the cost of their supplementing by up to 80 percent in some circumstances 
We have decreased all their labour costs with our full service models, and we've seen increases, and again, this is with PowerAway, of, of up to 15% increase in carving percentage. So um, very promising, well, very substantial, robust results, and that is the reason why we're raising more money to meet the demand of people wanting to have, their, have our technology platform on their property. Absolutely, absolutely. And just the last question here from David, have you looked at collecting individual animal drinking data via their electronic ear tags or similar? Something yes. similar, of course. Yes. Um, David, look, what we, it's part of some of these grants we want to, we want to do and, and to have individual ID and those things. Um, I think that these GPS ear tags are really, the tech's really great. There's a lot of people who are doing it. We're really interested in it. But the value proposition, the way you can commercially scale it, I don't think has really started. I think there's a lot of animal psychology mm. play in these tags. But, yeah, we, we are looking at that with some of the R&D we're doing. It's, there would be interesting data on the difference in, in water consumption of different animals. Yeah, great. Fantastic. Fantastic. And, um, uh, Javon, we'll, we'll absolutely answer your question. It's just come in. Is there any info on how, to in, um, how the increase in nutrients in cow waste products affect ecosystems? Yeah, I, I'll tell you the, the question. So in regards to urea and phosphorus, and I just want to sort of touch on what urea does. Urea is actually a, an additive or chemical that we don't actually feed the cow. We actually feed the microfluor and the rumen. So the actual bugs in, in the gut of the cow takes that urea and it, and it can turn into ammonia with enzymes and the bugs eat the ammonia. So what we actually do is by eating the ammonia, we create more organic products. In other words, more microflora in the room. And that's how we get more protein. Um, in regards to phosphorus, the beauty of water, of water supplement is we can control the amount of phosphorus so we get less of it coming out as waste. So mm. water supplement is better. And in regards to the, to the environment, I'll, I'll tell you how it works. If there's a lick block there and cattle are trying to, and the farmer's trying to get urea and phosphorus in, they cover the lick block with molasses, so like lolly. So if you can imagine a mob of kids hanging around a bag of lolly, they never leave to go yeah. and eat the apples, do they, on the tree, which is four kilometres away. What mm -hmm. happens now is we change the landscape. The animals come in and drink, and then they do what they're naturally meant, to go out and graze. So we're seeing rejuvenation of pastures where we're water something because we don't have lick on the ground sure. that animals then destroy the landscape. For sure. For sure. Super, super interesting. We're going to have to cut it off there. I really, really appreciate all the questions. And Mark, it's been such an insightful conversation. Um, and yeah, thanks very much to everybody who's who's tuned in and really asked these questions. I think the level of detail and I, I always find myself incredibly intrigued to learn a lot more about your business after this. So um, yeah, it's been very insightful. And thanks very much to everybody who's tuned in today. I think I'd love to finish off by saying of course if you haven't already expressed interest to invest in dit to kind of receive those updates about the upcoming investment offer opening next week to be able to gain access to it earlier than everybody else please do so i will follow up with you in giving you a link um which you can submit an eoi with uh, of course to be able to do that but mark any uh, any closing words from you Oh, Robin, just to say thanks to virtual everyone logging in. Like I, I always get overwhelmed with the amount of people express interest in our business. And I pride myself on, on myself and Ali and the team to ring every single person that's expressed interest. <laughs> yeah. I spent a lot of days on the phone. So some of you I might have spoken to, some I haven't. But Robin, everyone's got my phone number. If they've got any questions, just ring me. Just give me a ring. I'm available 24-7. As you can see, I love talking about my business. I love talking about um, what my mission is in life. Yeah. And, Anytime anyone wants to ring me, by all means, give me a ring. Fantastic. Fantastic. Everyone, thank you so much. We uh, we really look forward to opening up the investment offer next week um, and, of course, seeing some of you come in. So any other questions on the virtual side, we'll always add our details there. If you have any questions about the process of how it all works um, and if you just want to get in touch with me. So thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you soon. Take thank care. you, Robin. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mark. Bye. Bye.